Sure. Speech. I'm going to propose we include your last figure in our declaration as an icon. It was very nice. I have one comment and question. Uh, the comment is you said air pollution effects are hidden. There are two surgeons in Delhi who do surgery on lungs and thoracic area. Just by looking at the lung, they know who is living in Delhi. Apparently, they're the darkest. And they have documented it. So it is visible, at least to surgeons. <laughs> I want to ask you, given your expertise on the impacts of air pollution on cognitive functions, we heard from John Samet yesterday about a study which saying it could cause dementia, at least in the older population. And there was a study done by an Italian group. They followed school children. And those who were living in the polluted cities apparently had a lower IQ than those who are living in rural areas. It was a study which has followed, they followed this group for about 10 years. So can you comment on our knowledge on air pollution and cognitive functions? To the first comment, uh, uh, those surgeons are convinced and they can see the lungs and tell who was in a polluted area or not. I am convinced, and I can also tell, but the randomized clinical trials, believe me, are necessary to convince the medical community, even though it's obvious intuitively. Um, re regarding to the second point, since the Lead Act prohibition was implemented in the United States in 19, I think, uh, there are many Americans here can tell me 70 or 80, lead has decreased by 90%, and uh, IQ in children has increased two to five points in the United States because of the lack of lead. So there is definitely an impact on cognition. But I can tell you more about what you said. Uh, cognition, alter cognition alterations are very closely related, of course, to Alzheimer's disease, cognitive declination. And in the last very few years, three to five, I would say, there are strong, uh, there's strong data supporting a correlation between vascular disease or circulation to the brain and Alzheimer's disease. It's not that circulation causes Alzheimer's, but it precipitates, it accelerates Alzheimer's disease. Circulation is fundamental. That's why exercise is so vastly promoted to preserve cognitive function and the adequate nutrition. So the, the reason I think, the mechanism by which air pollution decreases cognitive function and could even lead to an increase in Alzheimer's disease is through the vascular mechanism affecting cerebral circulation. I show you circulation in the arm, but the, the microcirculation in the brain is the most susceptible to any change of any organ in the body. So it will decrease very fast with any of these risk factors. So the mechanism is you affect vascular function, vascular circulation, that leads to protein accumulation, amyloid or otherwise, and that is the explanation of cognitive decline associated with air pollution. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, congratulations, very powerful lecture and speech uh, with the iconic picture at the end. Uh, in your conclusions, you listed a number of points, and in particular, one of the first one was air pollution and climate change are linked to each other, but you did not really elaborate on that. Huh? So I, I really, because this is the theme of this workshop, I just wonder how much evidence is there, how climate change would affect, exacerbate, or alleviate, whatever, the air pollution crisis. So just do a thought experiment, if we would keep air pollution patterns the same as a reference scenario, and we would have this fairly dramatic climatic change, which means not only warming, but also change in precipitation patterns, change in circulation patterns, and so on. Is there any solid evidence this would have a major impact uh, on the air pollution? It's, uh, I think, a, a rich field of research yeah, because it's about synergistic effects and so on. But I think it's a big, big hole in our scientific evidence. Yeah. So maybe others will be qualified to answer this, but I think it is something we need to address. I had that conclusion before coming here, and I left it as a provocative thing. I'm happy you mentioned it. 
your comment is more valuable than mine because yesterday I learned about this relation between air pollution and climate change. So yes, you are the experts to elaborate on that. You're right. Just follow up. It's very important because we talk about the medical community and the climate community in a way, environmental community joining forces. Eh? So it's very important to know how much interaction is on precisely these major drivers of planetary health. Eh? Just briefly, as we discussed yesterday about inflammation from the chemical and physics side and the medical, there should be in the large cardiology uh, meetings of the world, there should be workshops combining the expertise of environmental people, chemists, physicists, and what we know from the medical part. There should be. Thank you. Emilio. Um, and you have mostly mentioned about air pollution, permanent air pollution in cities. I wonder if there are solid studies on acute pollution caused by large forest fires, for instance, those occurring in the Southeast Asia related to El Nino events. Studies on large, sorry? Uh, air pollution caused by large forest fires, as those that occur in, in Southeast Asia in 2015, 2015 or 1996, for instance. I'm sure there must be somebody here who knows about that. I don't. Maybe somebody knows? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, there, I, I mentioned yesterday that the studies show an average of about 10,000 excess deaths per year over the last decade or so, peaking at about 100,000 per year during the very bad fire years in the region. Okay, thank you. So just a, a comment. First off, the, I think um, it's, it's crucial to measure. If you don't measure, you, you're, you're not going to uh, be seeing the s stories that you see today. And of course, uh, as we become more sophisticated, uh, roadside measurements are probably more related to acute uh, effects, and we don't have the, all the data. But I, I just wanted to ask you, where do you see the um, the emerging pollutants uh, arise in regulation, for example, the uh, ultrafine particles, PM1, PM0.1, and what kind of research is there already uh, to relate these more specific ultrafine particles into the health effects? Particles more than 2.5? Yes, PM1, PM, PM0.1, which are the two roadside, uh, more, more combustion directly related than, than PM2.5 and PM10. First, uh, from the fires, I'm sure that some of the deaths, they, they apparently and intuitively they are lung deaths or, or from monoxide, but there's some could be coronary heart disease, as we showed before, acute heart attacks from breathing this particulate matter from the fires. Regarding this, even 2.5 particles uh, cause damage with nanoparticles uh, that come from them as part of them, and they go through the brain through nerves, not through the vascular system. So even those degrade into smaller particles. I, I don't know much of data beyond that. The mechanisms of 2.5 particles is not just directly the 2.5, but smaller particles of that. And uh, you have to measure, but the measurement I'm referring, and I was talking to somebody representing the Argentine uh, government yesterday, um, the, the, the trial should be done first. Otherwise, we are measuring. We have measured enough regarding the amount of particles. That's easy. Satellites is mapped. Uh, we know of the damage and the associations and even causality. Now we have to prove that it's decreased. To go on with research and know that you're investing correctly, you have to first prove, and you can do it in Chile, th this trial is not that expensive. I, 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 you have to calculate the N, um, but uh, with a p power of 80% for a P lower than 0 0.05, 500 people probably. A thousand people have protected and have not. After you have the results, then you can go on to keep measuring things based on solid evidence that you are preventing uh, people dying by protecting them. Congratulations for a fantastic presentation. Uh, I would like to start the day with a little uh, provocative approach here, because what you said is absolutely true. Uh, air pollution is not yet recognized in the non-communicable diseases global plan of action. 
And this is something that we need to learn and take a good lesson le there and see how can we change that dramatically because somehow we are part of the problem. The reason why the air pollution is not considered as one of the key risk factors in the global plan of action on non-communicable diseases is because we, the scientific community, are opposing to that. So this is part of the schizophrenia we have on our own community where because the, the global plan of action on NCDs is a negotiated one among member states and then decide on the risk factors that will be uh, prioritized under that, we s decided, the, the scientific community and the member states decided to focus on four risk factors. At the same time, WHO and the international public health community saying air pollution is a, the biggest risk factor, it has to be included. <laughs> but because it's negotiated. So my provocative statement here is we need to be a little bit more coherent and converge a little bit more on our narrative. Many of you are part of those national non-communicable diseases alliance and, and groups. Please pass the message that this has to be incorporated and this is a priority because the global plan of action has been approved, endorsed, and then ratified by many countries. That's why the, 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 the incorporation of a new risk factor, even if it's extremely strong, is not there. So please help us to solve this schizophrenic approach in our own community. It could be extremely easy. So thanks for putting that so strongly because we need to take uh, correction action on that. My second point is about communication. Again, I think we are reaching very, very quickly on what the conclusions on positive action needs to be. And you ha have included many of them. We need to just, uh, in my opinion, and I would like to hear from you, whether we need to put it on positive. And, and, and although we need to do more research for many things, uh, we know enough that to say that tackling the causes of air pollution will be extremely beneficial for, for public health. So I fully agree with you. It's just now whether you think we need to switch a little bit the way we pass those messages in order to be maybe more uh, um, having bigger impact on, on what we are doing. So help us to, to stop this schizophrenia, please, on the international community. Thanks. Brief comment about that. About that. You're right about, uh, right about the positive. If you tell somebody to have surgery that has a 90% chance of success, they have a surgery. But if you tell them they have a 10% chance of de death, they don't have it. It's the same thing. But people don't read it that way, so positive message is good. And this is a unique opportunity in the history of mankind of the largest convergence and ubiquity of communication. Seven billion phones, we were saying yesterday, two billion Facebook users, uh, to, to five zettabytes of data every two years. That was all the amount of data from the uh, origin of man until 2010. Now it's every two years. There are more cell phones than toilets and toothbrushes in the world. That's literal. So we have to use that for communication. And who to communicate is also important. We work on vascular prevention, so we teach everyday adults like us to eat well, to eat, eat a little less, to exercise, but we don't succeed because adults don't learn in general. So we had to che teach children. And there was an experience already in New York by Valentin Fuster in Sesame Street, teaching little children, kindergarten children, to learn about a good behavior, lifestyle behavior for vascular prevention. So the focus and, and the usage of the new internet revolution uh, will help us a lot, should help us a lot. Please be brief because we have four persons Really, and I think your very eloquent presentation has uh, maybe exemplified the fact that clinicians, as well as their responsibility to their individual patients, also have an important public health role. And I think uh, particularly when cardiologists and neurologists speak out collectively, this can have a big impact on policy. And I wonder if you see any um, evidence that that's actually happening on a local or a global scale. I mentioned that vascular disease could be decreased by 80% and it's not happening. There is much more interest in a nice stent, in the newest stent, or in a very expensive pill than in telling people how to behave and to not forget to take their medications. So there, if you look, you will see that there are no vascular prevention clinics. 
that should be vascular prevention clinics with uh, people specialized in exercise, in nutrition, vascular neurologists, cardiologists, diabetes specialists, they don't exist because the incentive is somewhere else. Quick observation stemming from Johann's uh, question regarding climate change and uh, air pollution with the connection. Uh, in some cases, not all, there could be a c common causal factor raising both. Uh, if it's an urban pollution, it could be due to diesel and, and just, just general auto exhaustion. It will amplify the climate change plus create the pollution and you'll see a correlation between the two, but it n need not necessarily be a causal factor. I think one of the elephants in the room is the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry, at least in the United States of America, has convinced people that cardiovascular disease, dementia, and so on is a cholesterol-driven disease, when it's really a disease of oxidative stress, uh, and it's not at all treated with cholesterol-lowering medication. So again, it comes back to the concept of education, education, uh, that we're, we're not providing the right information to consumers or to our health clinicians. This morning, I read a paper was just published showing that people with chest pain do not benefit from having a stent placed. But everybody that has pain in the chest has a stent placed. And even people without pain, if they are found to have a narrow artery, they will have a stent placed. So. The pharmaceutical industry spends $250 million per year in lobbying for Washington. So it, it's difficult to change that.